Hey, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all this morning. Happy Father's Day. I, uh, I, I told, thank you. I told my, my kids uh, a dad joke this morning, and I expect the exact same uh, result here. I expect a big eye roll from you guys, too, but... Uh, it was. It was. How did Moses make his coffee? He brews it. All right. <laughs> okay. Terrible dad joke. I didn't even get a laugh out of them. So, uh, just a big eye roll. So, glad to be with y'all. Um, appreciate Randy. Let me uh, take over his class while he's away. He's uh, he's traveling this week. So, I'm not sure when he's going to be back. Right, and this next Friday, so he's, he's going to be gone for a good long while, so I think he left Wednesday last week, uh, and then... He was gone Wednesday to Friday. Oh, okay. Friday night. And now he's traveling again. Okay. So he's, bur- he's burning the candle at both ends. Okay. Uh, before we get started this morning, uh, any prayer requests this morning? Okay. All right, we'll get started with a word of prayer. Let's bow. <clears throat> Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you thanking you for the blessing of this day, this morning that we can all come together, uh, that uh, we can come together in this one place with uh, like minds and hearts, uh, that we can look to your word uh, for wisdom and guidance, uh, that we can learn things uh, from it that maybe we didn't uh, know before, and that we can commune one with another and Uh, uh, bounce ideas off of each other and uh, to discuss your word uh, so that we may uh, gain greater insight uh, from it. Father, we uh, pray for all those that are on our our sick list or our prayer list. We we ask that uh, if it be your will that you return those uh, who are uh, sick or impaired in any way to us as it's, it's their desire to do so and ours to have them back here with us. Father, we pray for those that are traveling, that uh, you'll be with them, that they'll have safe travels wherever they may be headed, and they'll uh, <clears throat> return back to us uh, very quickly. Uh, Father, we uh, pray for our children, uh, pray for this class and the class that they're undergoing, that the teachers have had uh, ample time to prepare a lesson for them, that they'll be good listeners, good learners, uh, and that they will uh, gain more information from your word, from what you would have them to do in their everyday uh, walk of life. Father, we uh, thank you so much for your son, Jesus. He's given us this opportunity uh, to uh, be our mediator in prayer, given us this opportunity uh, to come to you and uh, ask uh, blessings and ask for care upon us. We thank you for him being our sacrifice, our savior, and it's through his name that we pray all these things. Amen. Okay, so as you see up there, Randy uh, prepared these slides for me. And I, I go against everything that I've, I've always said about doing slides, and that's never speak on slides you didn't prepare. So that's what I'm doing today. Uh, Randy prepared the slides, so hopefully I'll, um, I'll do a, a good enough job that uh, uh, we'll get something out of the lesson this morning. So... Uh, just kind of review where we're at. We're in Nehemiah, so go ahead and take your Bibles, your copy of God's Word. Turn to Nehemiah. We're going to be in chapter 8. <clears throat> uh, last week, uh, Randy uh, talked about uh, God's standard, the, the law, um, uh, walking, um, walking us through Nehemiah over the last several weeks. Uh, we're talking about Ezra uh, today and last week, talked about Ezra and the conviction that he put on the Israelites there. Um, as, they, as we saw that uh, spiritual famine, that hunger that the Israelites had uh, in, in bringing us to what we're seeing today, and that's that uh, spiritual revival that they're going through right now that, that uh, uh, Ezra, Ezra is bringing them through. It was evident that, um, that they needed uh, God, the Israelites did. It's evident today that we need God. Um, <clears throat> they knew it, we know it. And for them, what we saw at last week was that drove them to a response. Uh, the table was set by uh, Nehemiah and Ezra, uh, and 
at the tail end or at, in the scripture last week, I think he ended up in, in the end of verse 12 there, but you see that, that, they, were, uh, that they were weeping. They hadn't heard the word. They, they hadn't applied it to their lives. And now they're, uh, they're kind of you know, cut to the heart, uh, as we also saw in Acts chapter 2. They were convicted. They were weeping. Uh, they were truly uh, sorrowful for not obeying God's word. And we saw that reaction last week. And same thing for us. It kind of sets us on our heels, uh, or should set us on our heels, when we truly realize that we're separated from God. Uh, it should kind of kind of check us or have us to, to realize uh, that we are you know separate apart from God, and that we need to uh, have that desire uh, and uh, want to fix those things, just as we see the Israelites doing here. Again, similar to Acts two and verse thirty six through through thirty eight. A shameless plug for Wednesday night. I'm, I'm teaching Wednesday nights. Uh, we're going through the book of Acts. We'll, this week we'll be in uh, chapter 4 talking about, we'll start looking at the uh, persecution there. But uh, again, shameless plug here. Uh, similar to Acts 2, 36 38, we see, uh, we see the Jews uh, talking to Peter, uh, asking him at the, at the very end, after he had truly convicted them, and they realize it, they ask him what they need to do. Um, <clears throat> they were the ones that crucified Christ, just as we're the ones that crucified Christ. They asked Peter for instruction on what they needed to do, just like the Israelites asked uh, Ezra to read the word. They needed the, the word. So Peter stood apart from uh, the apostles uh, in, in bringing that first and second gospel sermon. Uh, and then Ezra is standing apart from the priests and the scribes uh, as he is preaching God's word. Uh, in delivering the law. So very interesting similarities between uh, what we see here, and we'll have a couple other similarities we go, as we go through uh, this morning's class, um, but between the first century church and what we see here with, uh, with Nehemiah chapter 8. So a little bit more background. Uh, as we closed out uh, chapter 7, we saw... <clears throat> the preparations prior to the feast. The walls are finished in, in chapter 6 and verse 15. So the, the walls are done. We see the doors are now in place in chapter 7 and verse 1. Uh, the porters are um, appointed. The guards are put in place. Uh, the singers are appointed. The Levites uh, are there. And the rulers are appointed. Uh, both of those faithful men of God uh, chapter 7 and verse 2. So all things are ready uh, for worship to begin. All things are ready for the law to be delivered. In chapter 8, we see at the beginning there, we see uh, that the people there are hungry for the law uh, to be delivered. They're hungry for the law of Moses. Uh, it's the seventh month or Tishri. It's autumn time frame. Uh, Israelites are stirred up. You know, they've, they've got some momentum behind them. They get the walls put up, the the doors are in place. There are more people in the city. They're, re in, they're inhabiting the city again. So new, new life and new energy uh, for the Israelites there. A new importance. Uh, uh, they knew the importance of the law. So they, they knew they needed to know the law. They knew that they needed to know their own history and the expectations that God had placed on them. They just didn't know the law. We see it, Ezra. Uh, chapter 7 and verse 25, we see that they didn't understand the law. They didn't know the law, and that was the charge for Ezra. Uh, so they hungered for the word, <clears throat> uh, and they honored the law. They stood when the, when the law was being read. Have you guys ever been in a congregation that has done that? Whenever you read God's word, have you ever seen that they'll ask everyone to rise, and they'll rise anybody? On a rare occasion, me too. I have too. <clears throat> There's a couple of nods uh, that I see, but I've been I've been a part of a, not a member of the congregation, but visited a congregation that whenever they read God's word, they all stood, they read the word, you know, before the preacher got up and did the lesson, and then they they sat down. So they were using this example that we see here that the that the Jews did in the in the Old Testament examples here uh, to uh, do the same thing, uh, honoring. God's word as it was read. So they stood and they listened. Uh, Ezra talked from morning until mid-afternoon, so around that six-hour time frame. 
Uh, and then he had folks in place there, not only himself, but other folks that would be there to un ensure that uh, the people understood exactly uh, what God's law had to say. And they were, they were weeping at the conclusion of that. Um, they were cut to the heart, which again is similar to Acts 2 and chapter, excuse me, Acts 2 and verse 37. So uh, stage is set uh, for day two. Day, day one we just talked about. Day two we're going to get into. We'll start uh, reading here uh, in verse 13. And we'll read through verse 18 at the conclusion of the chapter. So Nehemiah uh, chapter 8, verse 13, beginning. And on the second day we gathered together the chief of the fathers of all the people, the priests and the Levites, unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month. And they that uh, in that they should publish and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go forth unto the mount and fetch olive branches and pine branches, and myrtle branches, and palm branches, and branches of thick trees, to make booths, as it is written. So the people went forth and brought them, and made themselves booths, every one upon the roof of his house, and in the courts, and in the courts of the house of God, and in the street of the water gate, and in the street of the gate of Ephraim. And all the congregation of them that were come again out of the captivity, made booths, and sat upon the booths, <clears throat> excuse me, sat under the booths. For since the days of Jeshua, the son of Nun, unto, the, unto that day had not the children of Israel done so. And there was very great gladness. Also day by day, from the first day into the last, he read from the book of the law of God. And they kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day, was a solemn assembly according to that manner. So we have the chief priests, the, the, the chief of the fathers, the priests, the Levites, they're all coming together on this second day, um, uh, gathered together to, to Ezra to gain further insight from God's word. Uh, again, the, the first week, or first day, excuse me, was you know, the general public and all that were there. Second day, um, is, uh, as we see in verse 13, these, these thought to be very knowledgeable people. And one of the most inter interesting things that I found there myself was in verse 14, and that is what they found. So they were searching the scripture, they were, they were standing before Ezra uh, and, and the other men there, and what did they find? They found something in God's word that they either hadn't known before or hadn't truly understood before or hadn't been acting on before. I thought, thought that was very interesting. So uh, this morning we're going to talk about inside. They're the, the chiefs of the people, the Levites, uh, the priests are all there to gather together so that they can gain further insight uh, from Ezra. Uh, so what is insight? Uh, definition of insight is uh, it's the ability to see and understand clearly the nature of things. That's one definition. Another definition is the capacity to gain accurate and deep intuitive understanding of a person or thing. Let's see if I can build out this slide here. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so what does that mean? If you look at, look at inside, you can think of uh, maybe a little simpler concept, and that is maybe someone's biography. You ever read a, a biography of maybe a, a president of the United States or any popular figure of, of the past? You, you read their biography, you typically will know a little bit more, have gained a little bit of insight about that person, you know, what, what their family life was like uh, before they became this great figure, uh, how they grew up, you know, whether, the, whether they were uh, rich or poor as they grew up, what kind of education they, they had. Uh, understanding all of those things, having that insight of their, um, of their early childhood kind of helps you understand some of the decisions that they made later in life or how they became 
you know, that great popular figure. Uh, so that's what insight is, greater understanding uh, of a person or thing. Uh, or another example is uh, uh, how a car works. And most, most people just turn the key in the ignition, make sure the car's got gas or diesel, hopefully not both, uh, and they'll, you know, hit the pedal to the metal and they'll, they'll drive away. Um, but what may be a little greater insight into how a car works, uh, internal combustion engine, you have to have some type of spark, some type of fuel, some type of... Uh, oxygen and, and uh, compression, all those things combined to make a, an engine work. So there's a little bit more insight there. Uh, or uh, I, met, uh, I met Brother Ben in Home Depot a couple months ago, I guess. He was buying some pretty flowers. I was uh, buying plants and uh, he, he accurately guided me on when I should, should plant those plants. So Gardening tips, I would definitely either go to, you know, Ben or Dallas or, you know, somebody like that has lived in Colorado for a while, knows not to plant before June 1st, uh, even though that's what, exactly what I did, so I struggle to keep my plants alive, and if you plant after June 1st, you know, no problem. So those two gentlemen have a greater insight into the climate of Colorado, and you d definitely want to go to those two gentlemen um, to, to gain insight on that type of thing. So, anyway, uh, that's what insight is. That's uh, kind of a snapshot of a uh, smaller thing uh, that you can conceptualize on, on how to uh, gain that insight. So, uh, developing, the right, uh, developing insight takes the right amount of time. And I looked up, uh, there's a difference between being an expert in something and, and having just general insight in something. I'm definitely not an expert on vehicles. I'm not an expert on anything, but uh, I do have insight on a couple of things. Um, but I looked at uh, what it means to be an expert. You guys know how long, I guess, studies say that it takes to be an expert on something? Three years. Three years? I hadn't heard that, but I had heard five years. Okay. The figure I came up with was in hours. It was like 10,000 hours, so some type of expertise you know, delving into some very specific item, becoming an expert on that one thing, it takes about 10,000 hours or three, did you say three years? Three years or Ron says five years, so. Um, anyway, it, it takes a long time uh, to focus on this one thing to be considered an expert, but that's not what, what insight is. It's just a little bit more knowledge about, you know, a topic or, or a thing. So, uh, I would say, uh, the length of time, that right amount of time, really depends on what your subject is. Something like God's Word, uh, you can gain insight on, on particular scriptures. Uh, the whole Word of God, uh, that's, a, that's a difficult thing to gain insight on. Did you have a comment? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why they honored it, right? They, 
they honored it. They didn't have access to it every single day. They, they had to go to those priests and sit at their feet to gain that kind of knowledge. So, yeah, absolutely right. Good, good comment. And we'll get into that a little bit more uh, about uh, here later on about the insight that, that Ezra had in order, uh, in, as he placed, you know, those 13 men in that, that first day, you see them standing to his right and to his left. Uh, and ensuring that there's another 13 men that are in the crowd so that everyone understood. Uh, maybe not all of them could hear. Maybe not all of them were uh, staying attentive. So they were there to ensure that everyone uh, understood. So good comment. Uh, so also uh, regarding insight, uh, like mo most things, it depends on uh, how complex the subject um, you think of things like uh, trying to apply natural law, thermodynamics. You can understand basic com concepts of, of thermodynamics, uh, but to, to truly apply it, you need to have greater insight. Uh, maybe a couple of classes, maybe some physics lessons, things like that, uh, in order to truly be able to apply um, something that detailed. Um, <clears throat> Or you go to someone uh, that has worked their entire life in a particular field. You know, if I need advice uh, for some type of a, an issue in my home, I know that I can, uh, specifically like for plumbing, I know that I can go to Ron, and Ron's gonna have that answer. He's been working that for his entire uh, adult life. So he's the guy that's got a way more insight on that topic than I do. Same thing for God's word. We're gonna go to uh, someone who has more expertise, more knowledge than we do to help us gain further insight. Uh, exposure. Exposure does not necessarily produce uh, insight. Uh, we see in verse 13 um, that those, those folks, those uh, chiefs of the people, uh, those Levites and those priests, they're all there. They're all uh, what, what those people at that time would consider to be experts in, in God's law. They were the ones present, presenting the law. They were the, the priests over the temple. Uh, so those are the folks that, that you would typically go to or think to be going to uh, for a little bit of insight. But here, those folks are going to Ezra to gain further insight. Um, they were already exposed to the law, uh, but they, that doesn't necessarily mean they completely understood it. So they're going to Ezra for that. <clears throat> In Mark chapter 6 and verse uh, 33 through 52, uh, we see this is the, um, the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, or the lesson of the feeding of the 5,000, where uh, they, the disciples want to send them away. Jesus says, we're going to feed them, go you know, get the, the five loaves and two fishes, and we're going to set them up in groups, and we're going to feed them. And so they do that, and right after that, through the, the end of the, the verse there in, in 52, is where they're, they have the stormy seas, they're, they're rowing. So they had just seen the feeding of the 5,000, had been, been witness to that miracle that Jesus performed. And now... They're rowing as hard as they can uh, up, up, not up river, I guess, upwind, uh, battling against the wind. Uh, and they're just struggling so hard, and they see this figure walking uh, on the water. They, you know, don't know it's Jesus. They, they still have been exposed to that Jesus does this great and wonderful miracle. They couldn't. Um, conceptualized it. They were amazed at, at the, in verse 51 we see they were sore amazed uh, beyond measure and wondered. They couldn't believe what they saw. So they were exposed. They didn't necessarily uh, produce insight into who tr truly Jesus was and his true power. There's also no such thing as instant insight. I'll get this figured out by the end of this, maybe. All right. No such thing as instant insight. Uh, people are complicated creatures. Uh, there's a lot going on up here. Uh, when you're in a conversation with someone, uh, maybe they're not paying attention to you. Maybe they are paying attention to you. Maybe they're distracted for some reason. Maybe something's going on at home if you know, there's a problem at work. Uh, maybe it's, maybe it's, there's actually a problem at home. So there's a lot going on with people um, in, in order to to develop insight, uh, we got to well, figure people out here. Uh, so I, I looked, at, um, looked at this and I thought about you know, how, 
how difficult it is to bring someone to Christ or can be difficult to bring someone to Christ. And I think about my family members. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure we all have a family member that, uh, that we have prayed about, that we have tried to teach, uh, that either took a really long time to, uh, to come to Christ or maybe they never did. And I think about my grandparents. Uh, I, as I was younger, I, I tried uh, every way in the world I could, myself and my great uncle, um, to convert them, but they never, never came uh, to truly obey God's word. Uh, so that's, that's a tough one. I don't know, do y'all have a similar experience? Uh, you probably all do, right? Um, <clears throat> but we, we continue to pray for them, continue to work with them. Uh, that's our duty uh, as Christians is to, to bring others to Christ. So um, <clears throat> Uh, my, I guess my two best examples are my, my two kids, uh, John and Emma. Uh, Emma just turned 13 a couple days ago, but they both have obeyed Christ. And Lord willing, you know, eventually, uh, when, when it's right for her, uh, Leah will as well. My, uh, my father-in-law tells a story of, or at least he used to, he's a retired preacher. Um, it, I, don't, I guess that's a, maybe an oxymoron there. He never truly <laughs> retired as a preacher, but um, he tells a story of, of a husband and wife that for years attended on the very back pew. He, the, the gentleman would not come any further than the very back pew. His wife was uh, obedient um, uh, and a Christian, and, and he was not. And so for years, he preached messages. He, he taught him specifically. He prayed, uh, the congregation prayed for them. Uh, they, they were all kind of joined together to try to, to bring this gentleman to Christ. And his answer was always no. He's always saying no to Christ. Eventually, though, getting back to, you know, people are complicated creatures. Uh, something, something happened. Uh, either something was said specific to him that, that made something click, got him a little bit more insight on, on what, was, what he truly needed to do and why he needed to do it, and uh, he eventually responded. So... Uh, it's a great result. Um, some of us are, are in the South, we call them crockpotters. You guys know what a crockpot is? So you throw something in the crockpot uh, and let it cook for a long time. Slow. It's a slow cooker. So sometimes people are crockpotters. You just got to take a little bit longer. They got to cook a little bit more uh, before they're done. So that's what this gentleman was. He, he was a crockpotter. Anyway. Uh, insight uh, to understand uh, how the word relates to me, uh, my problems, uh, and to me and myself specifically. Uh, it's, it's, it's based off of wisdom uh, and not necessarily uh, age. It doesn't require uh, you to be old to, to gain that wisdom. Uh, the reference here is, is Psalm chapter 19, uh, 97 through 105. Um, says that uh, the commandments uh, made him wiser than his enemies. Uh, he understood more than his teachers. Uh, he understood more than the ancients. And at the tail end of that verse, or excuse me, that section of scripture is that the word, his word is a lamp unto his feet and a light into his path. And if we'll spend enough time, we'll meditate on the word as uh, we see here in, in Psalm 119, uh, then uh, it will allow us to understand the word to be that, that light. We'll gain that wisdom. And wisdom is, is not only knowledge, uh, but it's, it's an understanding. It's also action. So it's knowledge plus action. So here uh, he had the knowledge that, uh, that, light, that the word was, uh, had the capability to be the light underneath his feet. And the action was that he was to meditate on that word and apply that to his life. And so that's, that's what wisdom here is for us. Uh, and so uh, can we say that, um, that the commandments are our meditation? That's a tough one. Um, but it's pretty, it's pretty profound. Can we, can we say that we spend time in our day meditating Truly, med not just reading the word. We'll have this, um, this summer reading program across the way here for the kids 
and for us if, if you signed up for it. And that's a great way to get us in the scripture, but that's just reading the word. Uh, is, it, is it meditating on the word? Is it truly getting every bit of insight out of God's word and what he would have us to do uh, to, in learning his word to apply to our lives? Uh, is, that, is that what we're doing? That's a tough one. Do you have any uh, methods for that? Any idea how to get better at that for the group? Yeah. Yeah. You can spend a lot of time on one verse if you're if you're truly meditating on it. Yeah. It might take you a little longer than three hundred and sixty five days to get through the get through the word. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, great point. I actually got that one of my points here in just a little bit, but uh, to, to Tanya's point, that I think that's exactly, it might be what these guys were doing, right? They had, they had access to the word. They were, they were priests, but verse 14, they still found something uh, in actually investigating. Instead of just reading the word, going through about their, their day-to-day motions of doing, you know, doing God's law, doing all these, these steps and, and rules that they were supposed to do in the temple, um, here with Ezra, they're actually gaining insight on, on the why behind that type of thing. And I think that's why the, the booth thing is called out here. What, why did they um, not understand, or maybe they, they didn't understand, that uh, that was a command that they were to uh, make booths in this seventh month uh, so that uh, they remembered that 40 years that they were wandering in the, in the wilderness, that God was protecting, protecting them during that time, uh, but that they were to make booths so that they didn't forget of that time in that, in that wilderness. So they were gaining insight here. They were actually studying the word, meditating on the word, um, instead of just reading the scripture. They were being intentional about it uh, at, for maybe the first time in a long time, according to uh, the comment that, or the statement that, it says the first time they've done it since, uh, since Joshua. Okay. So continuing with this uh, idea that it takes the right amount of time, leadership must be able to see into tomorrow. So uh, and visualize the working out of a plan. So we see here that uh, both what we've seen with Nehemiah and with Ezra, that they're really in tune with what's going on around them. Uh, we see Nehemiah kind of avoiding the threats of their, of their enemies. 
we see here with uh, Ezra's insight in the plan uh, to, to be able to um, uh, provide the law to the people. He's able to execute this plan uh, because, he, uh, because he set up the right things in the plan uh, so that he could deliver the law with no other uh, in inhibitions. Uh, so if we back up in chapter 8, verse 4, you'll see that there are 13 people mentioned there. And then if you go to verse 7, you'll see that there's another 13 people there. The first 13 were, were to the right and left of Ezra. Uh, the second 13 uh, were, were there to continue to ensure that all the people uh, understood the law that was being read. Uh, he knew that he could rely on those folks. Uh, these might have been priests. These might have not been priests. They might have just been people that supported him. Um, they helped him support. And, and kind of visibly, when I think about you know, someone standing, um, standing on this wooden platform, the first time the, the term the pulpit uh, was, was kind of uh, said, and then you have those, that support group of men that are part of the community that are, are to your right and left. And then also in, in the crowd, uh, they had another 13 men that were there as support. They believed what Ezra was saying. They, they were able to kind of back him up on the law and ensure that people understood uh, the law that was being, being said. So um, kind of a visible representation that he saw, that Ezra saw, that, that might have been something that um, could help even one person in the crowd to believe what he was saying and that, that they needed to obey the law that he was reading. Uh, so also, uh, he used multiple tools to show his insight into that problem, to that solving that problem. Uh, he planned the event. He had the 13 both with him as well as the 13 uh, kind of dispersed, as we talked about. But he spent time in the Word. Uh, he spent time with the people. Um, and when I think about that, him spending that time with the people, he's standing there <clears throat> from morning to midday. He's delivering the law. He's intentional about it. He's spending time at, at the, the level that they need to understand it. So that, that shows that devotion uh, that, that he had. He knew that uh, I think that he knew that if he did that, that, that kind of shows a uh, you know, peace offering to the people that, uh, that I'll, I'm going to listen to this guy. This guy's working hard. Uh, he's, he, he wants to tell me something that's very important to him, very important to God, uh, and then I'm going to listen to him uh, maybe because of that. So he spent time in the Word. Uh, everything was set up. Uh, again, the, the walls were finished, the doors were finished. All the people that, that needed to be in place uh, were set up in a way that uh, they could have a successful delivery uh, of the word of God. There was nothing left undone. Uh, and I thought about the, the kind of symbology of that as well. And that is, we're here, to, we're here today to worship. We have a specific time set in place. We all know when we're supposed to be here um, uh, in order to worship. Uh, the leaders have been set aside. They know uh, their roles this morning for worship. Uh, we're all going to sing together. Uh, we're all going to uh, participate in the communion uh, with one another. Uh, we're all going to pray. Uh, all of those things, just, just as we see here that Ezra set aside in a very specific way, Nehemiah set aside in a specific way, so that the law could be read, nothing else in the way just focus on the law. Everything was set for us. And I think, you know, even, even during worship, we can uh, easily uh, lose sight of that. But here, uh, it's a great example of the importance of that time whenever we're studying God's word. Let's see if I can build this out or slow it out. Uh, knowledge necessarily isn't wisdom. 2 Timothy 2.15, uh, here uh, we have Paul uh, writing to Timothy. He says, to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So that's our goal. Uh, our goal is to study, show ourselves that, that we 
uh, know God's word and that we not only know it, we have that knowledge, but we can utilize God's word. <clears throat> Paul tells him earlier in that chapter to be a good soldier, to en endure hardiness or hardness, uh, to continue to serve, to commit these things to memory, and he lists out several things, to uh, shun uh, vain babblings, and to use that scripture to obtain salvation of the people. So uh, not just the knowledge of the word, but using the word so that he can bring others to salvation as well as uh, have his own salvation there. So plan for uh, experienced and actionable knowledge uh, in, uh, in James 1 and verse 5, asking God uh, for wisdom. Uh, we ask God in, in James 1 and verse 5, says that he will give that out liberally. Uh, so we should pray to God for wisdom. It also takes to be the right teacher. Uh, it takes insight. Uh, in order to develop insight, it takes the right teacher. I don't think we're going to have time to cover this. We'll cover a little bit of it just to give Randy a, maybe a head start for, for next week. Uh, but they, they went to Ezra, they being those, those specific folks on day two, those uh, chief of the people, uh, the Levites, uh, and the priests. They came to Ezra uh, for spe specific reason. Uh, in Ezra chapter 7 and verse 6, we see that Ezra was the ready scribe in the law, in the law of Moses. He was ready to preach, ready to deliver the law. Verse 10 says that he had a prepared heart. Uh, to seek the law and to teach. So uh, how many of y'all have taught a Bible class or uh, something of that nature to the kids or in here? or you know, There's probably a bunch of us, right? Um, there's a lot of preparation that has to be there, not just the, the literal preparation of the word, but you have to be in the right mindset and have the right heart to teach, uh, not, a, um, uh, not in a... Um, kind of I'm above you kind of situation, but in a, in a way that from your heart that you are uh, delivering God's word so that people will understand. It's not, it's not about the teacher uh, gaining any kind of elevation over the student. So Ezra had a prepared heart. And then verse 25, uh, it was so that all the people would know the laws in uh, the law of Moses. And in, at the tail end of verse 25, states that they did not, uh, did not know them. So uh, Ezra was the right kind of teacher. He had a heart for God's word, and he had a heart to teach. Uh, we see there, uh, we see the result in verse 13, and that is those people coming to him because they knew that he was the right kind of teacher. So we will uh, close it there. Um, any closing comments by anyone before we close out in prayer? Okay. Yeah, yes, sir. I have found that uh, recently that it's been very helpful to have an instructor help you with how to understand the Bible. Along with praying, it's, it's very helpful to have an instructor who knows scriptural Hebrew, Greek, really helps you understand the Bible. So I'm learning a lot. Yeah, good point. Yeah, you, you know that, that person that knows the, the original Greek uh, and, and Hebrew, okay. Uh, but they likely have greater insight no, uh, because they know the original language that was written in, that they can, they can help you interpret what, uh, what God is trying to say to you. So, good point. Any further comments? Okay, let's bow. God, our Heavenly Father, we come before you once again this morning thanking you for the time that we've had. We pray that we've been uh, attentive uh, listeners and learners, that we will, uh, what we have gained from this class is that we'll, uh, we'll take the time uh, to set aside a portion of the day so that we can learn from your word, not only reading the scripture, but uh, reading it in a way that we're meditating upon it really understanding, trying to understand what you would have us to get out of that portion of Scripture. 
uh, intentionally studying your word in a topical way. Father, we thank you for the example that we have here in Nehemiah, the example and the similarities that we see in your church today. Father, we ask that uh, you be with, with us as we continue to learn and go through this book. It's in your son's holy and righteous name we pray. Amen. Good to see you. It's been a while. Good to see you as well. Y'all doing okay? Yeah. Good. How about y'all? Yeah, I'm doing good. Y'all been traveling a little bit? Yeah. Oh, thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah, this week. Thank you, sir. Good to see you, sir. So, friends, thanks for having Thank you. Appreciate you. The weather is not hot. Much more hotter. You must have joined the tour. Right on. 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 Right on.